real food. God bless you, may be seated. Praise God. So good. Good to see Mark on that keyboard. I haven't been in so long. I heard them play in the background. I said, oh, that's getting in my, mm, that's getting down in my soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, we'll try that. He hears you. Yes, he does. I'm glad for that little up interruption. Aren't you glad we can be spontaneous in the Holy Spirit? We're not regimented. We're free. Praise God. It's been a little bit sad moment for Priscilla today, and we want to pray uh -oh. for that family as well. well okay, wonderful. those are the. Cr oh, boy. I'll just see other. Okay. I said, boy, my voice has changed all of a sudden. I like that voice I heard. I was coming from above. I'm glad it was from above and not from beneath. Oh my goodness. But this song really is a testimony. Jesus is precious. He is so precious. And after uh, we sing this, the pastor Peter, who uh, has been such a blessing in our lives, and we've been sharing with him in ministry for some time, uh, wrote the foreword to this new edition of the book. So I want him to come and uh, bring an introduction along with uh, Pastor Natalie, who is 
My wife thinks she's the greatest pastor's wife in all of Canada. Uh, uh, she just keeps telling people, uh, oh, Sister Melissa, if there's my Sister Melissa. Oh, she's great. She's great, okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, these people have endeared themselves in our lives. Isn't it important to have good, faithful people? They're, you really know who your friends are in the rough times. Somebody said, you know, uh, you've lost a lot of friends. He said, no, I just found out who were really my friends. You know, that's really the truth when you go through something and the reality of this. But Jesus is precious. It's just a testimony of our love to the Lord Jesus. Jesus is precious. I said Jesus is precious. <laughs> if you don't give me the back, I'm going to get to preaching. <laughs> Hallelujah. I think it's number 10, but it's, it's called Jesus is precious. How many love him? Yeah. Hallelujah. How precious he is. Glory to God.
introduce this lovely lady that I've been married to for now coming up November 62 years. She's like Jesus, never leaves me nor forsakes me. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And uh, we are blessed in this marriage and how good God's been. She'll be sharing that in her testimony. Praise the Lord, everybody. Isn't God good? Come on, isn't God good? How many are blessed tonight? I tell you, I enjoy all these old songs, don't you? I must be getting old. I enjoy all these songs, amen. I know all these songs. Growing up uh, in Parkdale Gospel Temple years ago, amen. What a blessing it is tonight that uh, we could all be here. And uh, and we just love the Rutledges, amen. I love Pastor Ralph, Sister Evan Rutledge. What a blessing they are. Can we give them a big hand tonight, everybody? Also honored to stand in this pulpit, Pastor Ray, Pastor Natalie. What an honor it is to stand here in your house, uh, hold the, your microphone and speak in this beautiful place. Uh, what a glorious church. Amen. Amen. God is good. And I hear all the great things that God is doing through this wonderful, amazing couple. Amen. Amen. Brantford Amen. shall be saved. Brantford is in revival. We bless God for them. Amen. Give them a big hand also. Thank you so much. Praise God. And Pastor, we're honored to have Pastor Ralph and Sister Evelyn a part of our ministerial team. Pastor is my pastor. Isn't that interesting? I'm the pastor of the church, but he's my pastor and has spoken into my life so richly, so amazing. I love them both so dearly. They are true generals of the gospel here in Canada and just amazing, wonderful, anointed people of God. I love you with all my heart, Pastor. You are a blessing to me personally and to my precious wife and family. Amen. Praise God. You know, I had the honor of writing the foreword in Sister Evelyn's book, and uh, what a blessing it is to have Pastor Steve Billsborough down in Florida to help, help bring this book back uh, to this generation, which is so needed. You know, you're, we really can sit in platforms and stand in pulpits and brag and talk about many things, but really, it's not until our faith is tested that we prove our true walk with God. Amen. That's really where the rubber meets the road, right? We can all talk a good talk, but the question is, will you remain faithful even when you go through all these different types of trials and tribulations? Is Jesus truly Lord of your life? Are you in this thing just to, just to be on the ride or are you in this thing for a lifetime committed to Christ? Amen. And I'll tell you what, uh, Sister Evelyn is that precious woman of God. Uh, she is, her testimony is absolutely amazing. There's a lot of people that come through your life as a pastor. There's a lot of people that touch your life as a minister. For, th for all these years of my life, I've had a lot of people come through, but I'm being sincerely honest when I say, this precious woman has touched my life like no other woman of God. To see everything that she has been through, everything she has endured, and to watch her sit, stand here tonight at almost 90 years of age, praise God, giving Jesus all of the praise with a smile on her face, and testifying about the goodness of God, this tells me this is a real child of the living God. This is a real Christian right here. Can somebody give the Lord a shout of praise in the house? Amen. You can give the Lord a shout of praise in the house. A few years back when I went through a big trial in my own personal life, I went down for some counseling to a great man of God. And he sat me down and he said this to me. He said, you are a good pastor. You'll be a great pastor now. Yeah. He said, because the testing and the trying of your faith will bring patience and bring a greater spiritual maturity in your life. And you'll be different towards people. You know, when you've been through something, you're more loving, you're more caring, you're more forgiving, you're more merciful, you're more graceful because you needed all that yourself. Amen. And this precious woman walks in that in such a powerful way. And I'm going to close with this very thing. When a pastor says close, don't, don't believe us. No. I am going to close with this very thing. He said this to me, something very proud, pr profound. He said, Peter, uh, people who have never been through anything really have nothing to say. And I thought that's very profound. 
And he said, a minister who has never been through anything really has nothing to say. Everything they're saying is from, from education or from study, but not from the reality of an experience with God. And so we all have to go through things and we, we should allow ourselves to go through these things because it allows us to have something to say and it truly has allows us to have something to give to those who need it. And tonight you're about to hear from a precious woman of God who has a whole lot to say and a whole lot to give. May we put our hands together and Pastor Evelyn. Amen. We're just going to pray for her, amen? amen? She's very fiery. There's fire in her bone. And, you know, she's been a mother to many. And thank you for loaning her here, too. <laughs> you know, like everywhere they go, they're love, right? So Bishop, I call him Bishop because, but we love you so much. And you know that. We, we really appreciate them. They supported us in many ways. Father, I thank you for everyone. I thank you for the heart of gold. I thank you for the heart of Jesus. Yes. I thank you, God, that she's a woman of compassion. I thank you, Lord, for the coals of heaven that's going to touch her lips tonight. Yes. Father, that you will just flow through her being, oh God, that every word will pierce our hearts, Lord. And Father, I thank you that all of us needs to hear it, Lord Jesus, of how, God, you take us through the hardest things, Lord, in life, Father, but God, you have remained faithful, and I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. First of all, to make mention of the fact that <clears throat> pastors Ellen and Steve Billsboro, who are our pastors when we go to Florida, we got flat pastors all over the place. <laughs> and they took it upon themselves after having been part of our congregation when we pastored Queensway. There were young people there, and now they're pastoring a great church in Florida. But they felt that this book of mine <clears throat> should be reprinted because it hasn't been in print since, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> 1986, which means about 37 years ago this book first came out. And uh, they felt it should be reprinted. And so they took it upon themselves, paid for it all for 500 copies. So you've got to buy a bunch of them. <laughs> no. <laughs> just teasing. No. <laughs> Anyway, I, I just, I'm so grateful, and their wonderful mother is here tonight, Phyllis. She's a part of this congregation, and she's done a great job in raising that boy. <laughs> and so, we're <clears throat> so thankful for this opportunity. In the book that some of you have already purchased, there is a poem, and this poem is actually a song. The path that I have trod has brought me nearer God, though off it led through sorrow's gates. Though not the way I choose, in my way I might lose the joy that yet for me awaits. The cross that I must bear if I a crown would wear is not the cross that I should take, but since on me tis laid, I'll take it unafraid and bear it for the master's sake. Submission to the will of him who guides us still is sure to have his love revealed. My soul shall rise above this world in which I move. Yes. I conquer only when I yield. Not what I wish to be, nor where I wish to go, for who am I that I should choose my way? The Lord will choose for me. Tis better far I know, so let him bid me go or stay. Amen. Ralph and I had that song at our wedding, and that was our desire, and that was our prayer, 
that the Lord would lead us. There are two verses of scripture that mean a lot to me. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. That's Romans 14 and 8. And my verse, Philippians 1, 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. There was a newspaper printed in May 1934 that said, a woman in Northern Ontario had five babies, and they were called the Dion Quintuplets. You that are my age know all about that. It made quite a, a stir that somebody could have five babies all at once. And then when my mother read that newspaper, she said, oh, that poor woman. <laughs> because she had just had me a week before. And she, she knew what she had gone through to have me and to think somebody had five babies. I was born into the family of George Lawrence, who was not a Christian, and my mother, who was a Christian. And so a family of uh, five were raised by them. I had a godly grandmother. My grandmother was four foot ten, little lady, but could my grandmother ever pray? There were times when I was privileged, when I was about eight years old, to go and spend the night at my grandma's. And uh, before I'd be in bed, she tucked me in, but she would be kneeling beside the bed. And she would pray. And she would name everybody in the family. When Granny prayed, you got prayed for. She never missed, and anybody in the house would hear Granny praying for them. Other times, she would take me on her lap and sing. And uh, she sang a song, I want to live so God can use me anytime or anywhere. I want to live so God can use me anytime or anywhere. And I was only eight and I thought, that's wonderful. Whatever that means, I want it. I want, I want God to use me too, Where, and whenever. We didn't have a car, so we had to be taken to church when anybody would be willing to drive us. But we did get to go to the Pilgrim Holiness Church for a time. And there I, I did uh, learn uh, about Jesus, learn the scripture, learn to love the Lord. And then we uh, went to the Pentecostal Church where my grandmother and my aunts and uncles attend. And they took me on one night, I was eight years old, and we had a guest speaker at the church that night, who was J.H. Blair, who some of you who are in the Pentecostal Assemblies would know he was one of the pastors. And he preached that night. And at the end of his sermon, he asked if anybody wanted to accept the Lord as their savior. And my eight-year-old hand went up. I wanted to accept the Lord as my savior. I started to cry. And a dear lady sitting in front of me, she said, would you like to go to the altar, dear? And I did. I went to the altar. I knelt down. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And this eight-year-old sinner became an eight-year-old saint. Amen. <laughs> I passed from death unto life. I became a, belonged to the family of God. And the preacher looked down at me in his rough kind of way. He said, you've got more guts than all the people out there that didn't come to the altar. 
I'm just saying what he said. I don't talk like that. <laughs> and so from that time on, I became a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was 14, I remember being in, from then, that time on, we went to the Pentecostal church. And uh, they had a special revival service. And they had two ladies to come as evangelists. And their names were Danelle and Holler. And she sure could holler at that dear lady. <laughs> but they were good. They were excellent evangelists. And so the one Sunday morning, one of them preached about Moses and receiving the invitation from the Lord to come up higher. It was more up on the mountain for him to be with God and to learn of God. And so it caused a hunger in my heart. I wanted to be like Moses. I wanted to get closer to God. And so when Sunday night came, we always had Sunday night services, of course, and the invitation was given to go to the prayer room if you wanted to go, and I went, got down on my knees, and I wasn't down there two minutes when I was speaking in a language I had never learned. I was filled with the Holy Spirit, and that was because of the hunger of my heart. God created that hunger and I wanted to draw nearer to God. Yeah. I, when I was 17, another event was held at the church where we had what we called a, a youth convention. And uh, again, at the end of the message, an altar call was given. <laughs> if, uh, you wanted to draw closer to God. And so, uh, I, along with a lot of other young people, went to the altar, and I stood at the altar, surrendering my life to the Lord, raised my hand to show a surrender, and when I did, somebody took my hand. And I turned to see who was there, and nobody was there. And I knew it was the hand of God. He touched me. Nobody was there on me had to be the hand of God who said, I want you. He chose me. God chose me. Amen. That day, God chose me to be his child and to work for him. And so, because of that call, I went to Peterborough to Bible College the next year, and uh, there I was learning the the Bible and being taught by wonderful teachers. I enjoyed that. Plus, they, we had things called uh, SPs, which were social privileges, which only had to have once a month, and it meant you could go out on a date once a month. <laughs> and so uh, I used up all my social privileges. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, I spent my second year there, and then uh, during that time there was this fine-looking young man in the third year. I was a second-year student, he was a third-year student, and uh, we kind of liked each other. And then he graduated and he came back to the school the next year where I was finishing, and. Uh, we went out again, and he uh, kind of asked me to marry him. <laughs> and uh, I kind of said yes. <laughs> but I had to finish my school year, and then he was traveling as an evangelist after he had gra graduated from school. And uh, then I, I graduated and went back to my hometown of Oshawa, and I began to work to save a little money to get married, because when you go to Bible school, you don't have any money, so. <laughs> so I had a job. So he would come, he would be preaching in different places, but when he was free, he would come, and, and we would, uh, that was how we did our courting. We were married in uh, May, and uh, we traveled. I felt very strange, uh, a new bride, and having to be in, 
different people's homes because that's what evangelists did back then, you know. He didn't live in a hotel. He lived in the pastor's home. <laughs> and so that's what we had to do for the for the first months of our married life. We, we traveled and we preached and uh, we lived in other people's homes. And then we were invited to pastor a little church called Port Perry which is north of Oshawa, which is my home. And, uh, oh, I was thrilled to pieces. I had a place of my own. I had, it was on the back of the church, but <laughs> it had a little living room and a little kitchen and a one bedroom upstairs, and this was all on the back of the church, but it was ours. It was mine, and I was so happy to be there, so happy to be pastoring in this church. And well, we were there about six months and I started to get sick. I was so sick every morning. And <laughs> I had to figure out what that was. <laughs> well, nine months later, our little Lori was born. His name was Lawrence, which is my maiden name, but we called him Lori. And uh, wonderful. Here I am, blessed woman with a beautiful baby boy pastoring a church with some lovely people. And then we got to the point where we felt that maybe we should move on. And uh, we started looking for some other place. And through circumstances, we ended up in Windsor, uh, where Brother Fitch invited Harold to be his associate pastor. And uh, that was wonderful. Windsor was a big church after coming over this little small place, Port Perry. And uh, while we were there, it was, we got to be um, used of the Lord in many different ways. Harold was quite a good speaker, a good singer. I've always been blessed with good singers. I noticed that. <laughs> and. Uh, I remember one one night I was at home with the baby and he was out at the church doing something and I said, Lord, I, I want to be at the church. Why am I stuck home with the baby? <laughs> and I really was complaining to God. And then the, the God said to me, Evelyn, if you will fill your place as a mother and wife and you will pray for your husband and stand with him. Then when the rewards are handed out, you're going to share in the reward too. So that comforted my heart to know yes. that I was a part of his ministry, although I couldn't be with him at times, mm -hmm. but the Lord saw my heart. After we had been there a couple of years, uh, we received a call from a church in Toronto in Willowdale, and uh, we felt that it was for us. And so we moved from Windsor to Toronto, and we again fell in love with the congregation, beautiful people who loved us and, and uh, made us feel so welcome and so part of them. We were there about six months, and one night after Harold had preached morning and evening, he came home and I had made him a, a snack. And all of a sudden uh, I was in the kitchen and I heard these groans and moans and I went in, I said, what's the matter? He said, I don't know, I've got such great pain. And because we had just moved to Toronto, we didn't have a family doctor, I had no one to call. So I knew he had to go to the hospital and was suffering such pain. So I went next door to the neighbor and asked if their son would mind driving him to the hospital. And so he did. He took Harold to emerge and uh, I phoned one of the board members and they came over and uh, uh, the wife came and she babysat and uh, I, you know something? I left out my my daughter being born, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you the the reason why 
I'm 89 years old, you recognize that, and you'll forgive me for that. And because of that, I don't remember the way I should. And so, somewhere along the line, I left out my little Laura being born. I'll tell you, while we were still in Windsor, our, our, our daughter, Laura, was born. And she was born on December the 24th, Christmas Eve. <laughs> and uh, it, she was just a joy, a beautiful Laura Evelyn, and a beautiful little girl. Anyway. So we're moved to Toronto again, <laughs> and we've got two children, a boy and a girl. And we're happy in our church, and Harold is suffering with a, a lot of pain. And he's in the hospital, and the board member is driving me to the hospital. And uh, I get to emerge, and by this time the doctors were checking him out to find out what was going on. But the wonderful thing about it, we must have had about 50 people from our congregation that had showed up at the emergency to be with me. Isn't that wonderful? I just love it when the family of God reacts in that way. That and so they did tests and they found out that, that Harold had a um, kidney stone and he needed to be operated on immediately and so the operation took place that night, and uh, he, he was in hospital for three or four days. While he was there, he had a beautiful experience with the Lord. The, he said as he lay in bed, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and, and he just, he said, I just reveled in the presence of the Lord. He said it was just an experience I would never had, and he had it while he was in his hospital bed. Then he was released from hospital, and he... Uh, came home and so we decided that we would go for a vacation rather than him to get back into the pulpit. We were going to have a vacation. And one day we, uh, as we were planning, we were sitting at the kitchen table and out of the blue I said, Harold, what if the, uh, the, the gallstone, no, kidney stone that you had what if it had meant that you were going to die? I said, who would you like to have to do your funeral? Now that's a funny thing to say to somebody who's just getting better, isn't it? And he told me, he said, well, Brother Finch, we had, were so close to him. He was our pastors and we worked with him. And so he, I said, that was good to know that he would like Brother Fitch to do his funeral. And so we made plans to go to uh, uh, Manitoulin Island. We rented a cottage uh, up there and we got ready to go. The day before we left, we had a little boxer dog. My husband loved the boxer dogs and he bought this little dog, boxer dog. And you have to clip the ears on boxer dogs if you know anything about them. And so the night before we were to leave on this vacation, he uh, uh, cried, moaned all night long. So it was quite an experience with that dog. However, morning came and uh, I took the baby and, and got her washed and ready. And, and uh, little Lori said, Daddy said, it's time to go, you better come. And so we were trying to be on the road by eight o'clock. And we drove on Highway 69 till lunchtime. And I said, oh, we better look for a picnic table to have our lunch. And we hadn't found one. So we said, well, let's lay a blanket up and then we'll just have our lunch there. And we did. We laid the blanket out and we uh, sat around, had our lunch. The children had a chance to run around with the dog and have a little play, stretch their legs. And we got back in the car and we drove along the highway. And the Lord said, it's appointment day for three. Just as we were about to go into the city of Sudbury, uh, Van came over the hill 
and the driver lost control and he hit our little Volkswagen car and sent it spinning down a 15-foot embankment and called into the presence of the Lord, Harold, who was 28, and Lori, who was three, and a little bit later, Laura, who was 18 months old. When I realized what had happened, I saw the van coming toward us, and Harold, with all of his might, turned the wheel to try to avoid the imminent collision. And he put his arm out to protect me. And then the next thing I felt that was about a thousand flash bulbs went off, and I lay with the car on top of me at the bottom of the hill. And as I lay there, from my spirit, I was saying, help me, help me. And then a wonderful thing happened. As I lay there before help came, the spirit of the Lord came as a comforter. And that's his name, he's a comforter. It wrapped himself about me, just as if somebody literally took a blanket and wrapped it around me. I felt the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And then I heard the voice of God say to me, Evelyn, I will work this all out. This is my will for you. Then men came, lifted the car off of me, and I got up and walked and never had a bone broken. Wow. That was wrong. I was badly bruised, and the bruises got worse as the days went on. I swelled up, but I had no bones broken. And then I said, where's the man in the truck? Because I knew it was a truck that had hit us by this time. Cars had stopped, people had stopped. Someone had called the police, and it was a lot of people there, and the man came to me. And he said, just, I'm the man in the truck, he said, and just as I got to you, I had a dog, a boxer dog, another boxer dog tied up in the truck, he said. And then just as, as I got to you, he broke his chain and he jumped on me, and he caused me to lose control. And that's when he banged into us. The police came, and, and they, I was so good. I mean, I looked, looked around, and, and my husband was thrown out of the car. He was dead. My little boy was standing up in the back. His head had been caught, and he was dead. The baby had been in my arms, and she was thrown out. Even the little dog was dead. And yet I was able to walk up the hill with a, uh, a lady who had a car there. And she, the police said, will you take this lady to emergency? And that's how I got to emergency. It wasn't even in an ambulance. A lady who I did not know even took me to emergency. They put me in one room and then I saw the ambulance come with Laura because she was still living. And she was in the next room. I could hear her cry. I wanted to go to her, I wanted to hold her. And then they, I, had, I had asked, actually, Harold, as we were traveling along, I said, who is pastoring in Sudbury at this time? And he said it was Homer Watson. And I thought, Catalan, yeah. Homer Catalan, and so I, that was good to know. So when I got in the hospital, I asked for Homer Catalan. I didn't know anybody in Sudbury. I didn't have a soul there, and all this has happened. And so they phoned the Pentecostal pastors. Wonderful to belong to the family of God. I mean, who else can you turn to for help? But those who belong to the family, and they, they were my family. 
But as I, I waited in the, in the emergency, the uh, nurse said, we're sorry, Homer isn't available right now, but we'll keep trying, but would you like the chaplain to come? And I said, sure. And so the chaplain came in and he talked with me, he was very kind. And uh, I didn't know that I had said the right things to him, but I told him that my family are with the Lord. I said, they're, they're with the Lord, and so I'm going to see them again. About some years later, when we were pastoring in Queensway, a lady uh, came up to me and she said, are you the lady that was in the accident at Sudbury some years ago? And I said, yes. Well, she said, my mother had just la lost my dad and was going through a terrible time. She couldn't release him to the Lord. And she said, our pastor, who was the chaplain of the hospital, came and told her about this wonderful young woman that he'd met in the hospital who had lost all of her family, and yet she still had the confidence and the assurance that she was going to see them again because they were all going with the Lord. I thought, Lord, you're so good. I mean, oh, that was many years later to find that out, that I was, I was saying the right thing, even though I was in, in turmoil inside. The right things came out. They took me out of the emergency room and, and laid me on the table because I had a cut here. I still have a, a bit of a scar, but it's faded a lot. I must have banged the windshield. And so they were going to sew that up. The nurses stood around, maybe three of them, and, and the doctor came. and. Uh, one of the nurses had a needle. They figured that maybe I was going to break down at this point in time, we need it. And the doctor said, your baby has died also. And I said, well, she's with the Lord. And he shook his head. He just couldn't comprehend the peace. That wonderful peace that came to me in the on the ground when the blanket of the Holy Spirit wrapped himself around me, it never left me. It was with me. It came with me. Came with me to the hospital. Came with me in all the days that I had to face every time. And then they took me off the table and they uh, set me on a chair and a nurse brought a basin of water and she knelt down in front of me and she started to clean cinders out of my knees. I must have went into the car that, under the dirt that way because my knees were full of cinders and scraped up. And so she was cleaning them out. And uh, she said, if I ever have to go through an accident, I hope I can go through it like you are. I said, I'll tell you what to do. I said, you get to know the Lord today while everything is good with you. When you've got your clear head to think, and you're not on drugs, and you don't, you know, you're not overwhelmed with grief that you can't think. I said, now is the time to accept the Hallelujah. Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. And that's, that's good for you too tonight. Amen. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Right Amen. now. Amen. There's no other time in like the very present hour that we're in. And uh, while we were there having that done, the uh, Homer Catalans came at the hospital and they came, even though I don't remember ever having met them before, probably I had it, but, and they had me and they took me to their home. And in the meantime, I had given the hospital uh, who they were to call as far as my parents and Harold's parents, but the police had done a good job. They had found Harold's license, his ministerial license on his, in his wallet. And so they had called the head office of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. They had, they had phoned his parents who lived in, in Michigan at the time, Detroit, and uh, phoned my parents and they all had received the news of the awful accident. And then uh, uh, 
My parents and my two brothers got in the car and made their way to Sudbury. Uh, the, the, uh, had arranged for us all to have sleeping areas. They gave us their bed. My mom and I slept in, in their bed. I couldn't sleep. I, I looked out the window, I looked out into the blackness of Sudbury and I thought, what a terrible place Sudbury was. <laughs> it had nothing really to do with that, just the way I felt. So I didn't sleep. But to the glory of God, I say, after that, I slept every night. The psalmist says he gives his beloved sleep. Hallelujah. And I would say, Lord, I'm your beloved, and I want to sleep. Yeah. And I slept. I slept every 